Um, good afternoon. I'm David Orth. I uh, will have the opportunity to moderate this uh, third panel, which I think is going to be a, an interesting continuum of uh, what we've talked about throughout the day, um, kind of knitting together some of the concepts around nitrates and nitrates management and water quality uh, with the Sigma discussion and, and um, to kind of look at into the crystal ball, um, you know, what the future for the San Joaquin Valley is. Um, Ellen mentioned when she started off this, this afternoon that um, PPIC's Water Policy Center is conducting a study and everybody uh, here is uh, part of that group, either in a uh, supporting or advisory committee role to really start looking at um, what, what does the collection of issues and regulations mean for, for the San Joaquin Valley. Um, I'm particularly interested in this for a number of reasons. You don't gather this out of reading my short bio, but I've had uh, uh, 30 years of water management experience in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, serving as the manager and finance director for a very small district on the west side called Westlands Water District. <laughs> Um, but then also, uh, more recently, uh, in addition to managing the Kings River Conservation District, played a key role in the development of the Sigma, uh, Sigma legislation. Some of my colleagues haven't let me off the hook for that yet. Um, and then even more recently, as a member of the California Water Commission, I've worked very closely with DWR uh, staff as they've developed the regulations. Um, so I think, you know, obviously we have a an interesting uh, history in the San Joaquin Valley and, and we'll um, drill in now to, to kind of what we think the, the future issues might be. Just as a quick overview and there will be a map here that shows up very quickly. Um, you know the, the San Joaquin Valley uh, study area is um, about 20 million acres in total. It's those big brown spots right in the middle of the, the Central Valley of California. Um, that area represents some of the top ag producing counties in the nation. Fresno, Tulare, Kings County, Kern County are always uh, very high up in ag productivity um, and a very key part of California's ag sector, but also I think we heard earlier the potential of a paving over of the entire San Joaquin Valley for population growth. I hope not. Um, some critical ecosystems that are attempting to be, that, that we're attempting to restore and protect and then in the face of that, just the continued overdraft and the impact that has on environmental systems, the agricultural community, and the, the hundreds, hundreds of small disadvantaged communities that rely solely upon groundwater. So we're going to go through the uh, same format as uh, the two previous panels. We'll have uh, four brief presentations, starting uh, Alvar from uh, Public Policy uh, PPIC will give a kind of an overview of the study and some of the issues. Uh, then uh, Richard Howitt will talk about some economics relative to groundwater. Uh, Dr. Harder will talk about water and atmospheric pollution. And then Sarge Green um, will uh, talk a little bit about some of the institutional issues and I suspect we'll drill a little bit even further into institutional conversation um, during Q&A and certainly want your engagement in all of this. So. With that, I'm going to hand it to Alvar and, and let's get going. Hi. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, pretty much talk, as, as Dave has mentioned, about this project that we uh, kind of launched last, by the end of last year. Uh, we are looking at the San Joaquin Valley, um, envisioning the futures. Uh, it's really interesting, you know, all the two sessions that we have, been, have seen before, the first one, we have seen mostly at the field scale, how, how how we have to incentivize, recharge, and other issues. And the second, we have, see, we have seen the issues at the local and state level. So we are trying to, to combine all these things here and, and to apply that real issues uh, in the San Joaquin Valley. That probably is, that probably is the uh, most vulnerable region in California. So why we selected this case study? Uh, during la the last years, we have seen, for example, in 2015, uh, around 50% of the surf surface water curtailments were in the San Joaquin Valley, and more, uh, about uh, over 70% of the statewide ag ec economic losses were also in that valley. We have seen also a lot of issues with domestic wells, more than 2,000 domestic wells reported dry, a lot of issues in water quality, there's a lot of nitrates, so we have 
uh, increasing concerns on water quality for, drink, for uh, drinking water. And also air quality. Uh, according to some data released recently, uh, in, with particular matter, the San Juan Valley is one of the world worst regions also in the United States. There are other chronic problems. We have ecosystem problems, salinity problems. So uh, I don't know if it's sad or it's exciting, but it's one of the, <laughs> the most interesting uh, regions where, where, where we can look at in California. So uh, we have here the, the map. We are accounting for the eight counties that uh, is the San Joaquin River Basin and the Tulare Lake. So besides these challenges, one really interesting thing as well here is that the San Joaquin Valley is, one of, is the state uh, agricultural leader. Around 50% of agricultural output comes from this, from this uh, region. And we are comparing here the key uh, economic indices like empl employment revenues and GDP in the Valley and in California. We used to say that uh, around 2% of GDP in California is the ag sector. It's not so important in California at, at, at the overall scale. But in the San Joaquin Valley, this number goes up to 15% of employment and GDP and up to 25% in revenues. We're including here only direct effects of ag and crop and animal production and also direct effects of, um, of the food and beverage processing industry. So because of that, uh, you know, the agricultural sector that is the most water intensive user is uh, uh, the, the state, this region is really relying on water. And what's behind this as well? Sorry. Uh, in order to try to assess a little bit or to, to put a, a little bit of, of background here, this is the kind of the, the water balance in the valley. 10.4 10 uh, million acre feet per year is used in, in the valley, consumptive use. And this comes uh, especially uh, for, from three different sources. We have like natural sources from uh, mostly from the western, from the eastern uh, mountains. We have uh, uh, around 6.1 million acre feet of inflows and also almost one million acre feet of precipitation. But besides the natural, the natural inflows, we have 30 percent of the supply comes from the imports from the delta, and also historically we have a groundwater overdraft. Uh, of 1.6 uh, million acre feet per year. This is data from 1998 to till uh, 2010. So we have 50% of kind of natural recharge in the, na natural flows in the delta, 35% of imports from the delta, and 15% uh, <coughs> of groundwater recharge. So because many challenges on the delta also for biological opinions and others, and also you know, the application of sigma that will cap this groundwater you know, overdraft. We, we foresee a kind of a problematic uh, uh, future for in, in terms of water supply. So what do we want, what do we want to, to look at? So there are different uh, uh, analysis that we can look at in multiple sectors related with water. First, about water supplies. If uh, there's investments on, on surface, uh, groundwater storage, also adding flexibility to the, to the system with new infrastructure that can help to manage the system. Then uh, also different options for implementing Sigma. We have, uh, we have he uh, been uh, hearing before how there are some different ways to implement Sigma. We can think about shares. Uh, we, have, we can think about a cap-and-trade kind of market, allocating permits and then uh, a capacity to trade that, that water. And also, we, we, we have to think about mitigating the exter externalities, uh, dry, ground, dry wells, uh, salinity, sorry, nitrate issues, or subsidence. Then uh, there are different economic pathways that we can do. So agriculture has been adapting almost forever, and it, it will. So there's a lot of, of things about which crops do we want to plant there. Also, techno technology, uh, investments and technology innovations on the genomic and other issues that will increase uh, yields. But, uh, and also we have to look, to look at the different economic issues with, within the stakeholders uh, on different groups, small versus large farms, ag workers and others. 
And finally, uh, there's a lot of issues going on uh, as well on the ecosystem services. Uh, we have been talking a little bit about uh, that redu reduction in potential supply that we kind of foresee uh, um, uh, an, in an increase or a, a lot of some land retirement in the valley. So there's different ways also to, to take that uh, land retirement. We can, uh, we think that a strategic early land retirement could be I interesting, and we have to think about potential uh, synergies between ecosystem services and and, ag and the ag uses. So that was more or less the overview of the of the, of the project. And now I will hand it to Richard. Thank you, Alvaro. Um, first of all, I must say th this work is joint with my colleague at ERA, Duncan McEwen, and for a, a deep and, and theoretically correct technical exposition of the economics of groundwater tomorrow morning at the early session he's given the paper. I, I'm reminded of the uh, 1992 presidential election campaign when James Carville <coughs> coined the phrase it's the economy, stupid. <laughs> because that's what people are worried about. Who's going to get cut? How much? What's it going to cost? How can I adapt? So I'm going to, that, and those are the questions that we're trying to answer for the agricultural economy, but we also, of course, include those valley cities uh, and their demands on water. And so, Moving on then, who's going to get cut? Well, let's have a map. And so we're going to get cuts from 5% or less to 25%. Pick your region where you are, guys. <laughs> and you can see this was established. Now, this is the first cut that we did at ERA because we realized that we had the data from 10 years of runs from 09 to 99 of the C2V SIM groundwater model. And the C2V SIM DWR grammar model has exactly these broader detailed analysis units, um, hydrologic units, that we have in our economic model. And so we can directly get the groundwater model talking to the economic model. And, saying, and so we took a 10-year period and said, what would you have to cut in terms of water use, overall water use, in order to bring your basin into steady state over those 10 years. This, of course, allows for the essential function of groundwater, which is the drought reserve that lots of other speakers have emphasized. And so this is what we're looking at. If we have no trading between regions, no surface augmentation, we've had a whole panel on how to do that, to get those little flood flows and so on. But um, as Dave Gutierrez says, they don't come cheaply because they come very infrequently, and therefore that means the expected cost could be high. How can ag adapt? And for this, we've built in a really important component of the value economy, the dairy industry. Because the dairy industry is linked to the ability to grow forage in the form of silage, which cannot be imported because of its weight. And so we put them together and imposed a 15% cut across them. And this is what happens. That alfalfa drops, grain drops, cotton drops, safra, and, and very low dollars per unit water field crops actually increased. The cows, I've divided them by 10 to fit them on this histogram. In this particular subregion, there were 600,000 cows. We have 1.7 million cows. Talking about future population <laughs> scenarios, remember, one cow generates the same waste stream as about eight people. So let's say 1.7 times eight. Wait a minute. We've already got 15 million extra people in the valley, um, and they are producing milk. Um, cows don't budge. Silage moves just a little bit because they, they change the rations a little bit. To, to, to buy more mid season. Orchards and vines take a small drop, but not much, as do vegetables. Point. Ag can adjust. And, and in the future runs, we're going to put a price tag on that as part of this firm. So, 
Where are all these cats? And here they are. This is 1.7 million. And the cows are concentrated where the overdraft is greatest. That is a problem. And so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have an equalizing. If the cows can't move because the dairies and the milk um, units, uh, high capital investment won't move, then we're going to have to move the water to the cows rather than the cows to the water. Or perhaps both will happen. So the take-home point here is that far from the wasteland idea of millions of people and no ag, we have a very vibrant ag that produces perennial crops, high-value crops. But we have to have the groundwater to offset the risk of drought. And as we move to more and more perennials, it's more and more important that our groundwater is stable. And so Sigma is going to be an essential risk reduction mechanism which will allow California Ag to expand as our markets will expand. Thanks. Over next. So speaking of cows, let's go. We had a very good session this morning already talking about nitrate. And I, in, in, looking at, in looking at futures for the San Joaquin Valley, we cannot just focus on water supplies. We have to also take into account water quality. Um, we have large amounts of very intensive agriculture. And this morning we talked about uh, the drivers for the large amount of nitrate pollution that we have and experience in the San Joaquin Valley and San Joaquin Valley groundwater, particularly along the east side of the, the eastern half of the San Joaquin Valley. And the large driver for that is agriculture. And so I'm going to actually step back for a minute from the cows and talk about crop agriculture as a whole. Um, over the last uh, 60 years, we've had huge increases in the amount of uh, uh, crop production. Um, we've had, in the, in the middle part of the 20th century, large increases, commensurate increases in inorganic fertilizer use. Um, they have pretty much stabilized over the last uh, 20 years. Um, and uh, what has increased in the latter part of the 20th century is, is the amount of manure due to the increase in the in the herd size. That nitrogen that's been input into this landscape, which is shown here on in these left bars, um, is going into various sectors shown here on the right bars. Um, about 40% of it goes into the harvest. There's some of it that goes to the atmosphere and some of it that's lost to stream. But this light blue bar is the, um, is the nitrogen balance that's essentially available for recharge to groundwater. And <coughs> we talked about uh, the fact that we're increasing the amount of nitrogen storage in our groundwater basins in California. And that's the annual loading that we, that we get there. This is roughly speaking um, three to four times more than we could uh, would allow uh, based on, on drinking water conditions, which is how we define good water status um, in, uh, to use a term that's used within the European Union Water Framework Directive. So we have this imbalance between inputs and outputs, which are essentially carried then by groundwater and become a drinking water issue. Um, and so that's, that's one, one big issue to address. Um, the dairies are playing a significant role of, in, in this. As you can see here, the, uh, the, the, uh, the manure input to the overall nitrogen balance is significant and it has risen very sharply between the 1970s and the early 2000s and has since leveled off. Uh, one of the things that uh, to point out here, we have a, in the state, we have a total of 1.8 million, it's about 1.3 or 1.4 million uh, milking cows in the, in the Central Valley. And um, we have about 300,000 to 400,000 acres of cropland that we, that we use for these cows. And much of that cropland actually receives the manure that's generated by these by these cows, somewhere between 80 and 150,000 tons of nitrogen just in manure that's going on these 300 to 400,000 acres of land. That's a very large amount of nitrogen on, on not that much land, but it's, it's part of a nitrogen cycling, uh, nitrogen cycling system that we're, that we're in the process of 
uh, improving in terms of how we do that. Salinity is another big factor. We talked this morning about nitrate. Um, we didn't touch much on salinity. Daniel Kozad is here, um, who is the executive director for the Central Valley Salinity Coalition. They have gone through a tremendous effort in the last 10 years trying to figure out where are we on salinity, who, who, who is bringing in salinity, and what needs to be done to address salinity issues, which has which have major impacts um, on actually on agriculture itself, uh, because higher saline water is damaging to crops when crops are irrigated with that water. So figuring out the salinity equation is a key piece. Um, and many, many areas, in particularly on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley, but then also west side of the Sacramento Valley, um, are, in, are out of salt balance, so to speak, and are looking at, at needing very costly um, solutions to um, um, address the increased salinity in groundwater. Um, we have air quality issues and climate gas issues in the Central Valley that tie back to, to uh, farming, in particular, again, to dairies. Um, the state just um, completed, um, a, I think it's a draft policy on short-lived climate pollutants, um, and the biggest one of which is methane. Um, the, the state is on course to um, significantly reduce its uh, climate gas emissions, it's uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and, and this is part of the state policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and the Air Resources Control Board, the regulatory agency that is implementing uh, the policy, has recently come up with some significant, uh, uh, significant changes in policies that would affect um, dairies, which are, which are the largest or one of the largest producers of methane in the state. Um, and there are, there are proposals on the table for uh, major changes in how we manage dairies, um, how, we, how we manage the waste in dairies, how we manage wastewater in dairies. Um, and these, these proposals have actually significant, potentially significant impacts on, on water quality. So um, this is, without going into details on this, uh, the point here is we have in parallel multiple and multiple regulations moving that impact the same sector, the agricultural sector, and in particular the dairy sector. And we have to take a really hard look at the cross-media effects here, both in terms of water quality, water quantity, and air quality to make sure we're really addressing all of them efficiently. Um, we're looking at, in order to address both the nitrate and the salt problem, we're looking at nutrient management practices. We talked this morning about the four R's, right management, right timing, right nutrient, right placement. Um, we talked about how do we how do we get these management practices to the farmer. We talked about farmer education, farmer outreach. We talked about the type of policies that may be improving nutrient management. We're looking at salt tolerant crops um, to work with the salinity. On dairies, we're looking at digesters as one of the newer technologies to address some of the issues. Now, digesters are great in addressing the methane problem. They take the carbon out of the waste stream, but they leave the salt and the nitrogen in the waste stream. And so one of the things that we need to look at from a research perspective is can we put another black box onto this digester that takes the nitrogen and the phosphorus out of the waste stream and makes a commercially available fertilizer out of that. Um, and then the same the same with the salts. What do we do with the salts? So taking the salts out here is another big system. Uh, a big, big issue. I think I'll leave it at that and approach our next speaker, Sarge. Sarge. Okay, good afternoon. I get the institutional piece. Um, okay. This is an interesting slide I put together. I think you heard a little bit about the concerns about Sigma a little while ago and, and the fact that we have um, a new law that we have to deal with. It's creating a lot of uncertainty, especially in some of the local agencies. But those of you who are not from California, this has been actually going on for some time in, in terms of changes in policy. So this is now what I call the sum of all the fears, um, a Tom Clancy novel. Uh, this is the cumulative changes that we're dealing with and you heard a little bit about some of it earlier today also. Perry Clausen talked about the irrigated lands program that's up here. But real quickly, I'm going to go over them so that you understand part of the, 
framework that we're dealing with and, and what it leads to is a we need a very robust discussion in the future of the San Joaquin Valley on future institutional controls. How do we rebuild ourselves or how do we manage what we have so that we can work together much more efficiently in getting uh, some of the things done? The first thing that happened that's relatively recent is the biological opinions were changed in 2009 that redirected more water out of the delta and that meant less water that came to the San Joaquin Valley and that has a cascade effect in the San Joaquin Valley. When you don't get water to certain people in the San Joaquin Valley, means others can't. Specifically, there are some very senior water right holders in the very center of the San Joaquin Valley, known as the exchange contractors, and they get water from the delta, but the combination of the drought and the other uh, problems in the delta, they were not able to get that water, and that water had to run down the San Joaquin River to them, and then the whole east side of the San Joaquin Valley from Madera County down to Kern County got a zero allocation. So uh, the... Uh, Biological opinions are a very important part, then, of how we uh, address water supply in the future, and uh, it does have a very important effect, then, on the San Joaquin Valley. The Delta Stewardship Council is a new institution that uh, is kind of an opportunity to take a good, hard look at it to see how it's working, how it's dealing with things, because it was designed to encompass all of the issues in one place in the Delta. And so it's got a tremendous responsibility, including some influence on land use planning, which did not make the counties very happy. And uh, you heard a little bit about counties and land use planning already in Sigma as well. So uh, that's kind of a case study that we may have to take a look at. The water measurement uh, business meant that both agriculture and urban measurement was intensified. Uh, you also heard that a little bit about that earlier, that we now have uh, a responsibility to measure uh, not only then uh, in the future groundwater, but every drop going out of irrigation systems has to be measured in an, an efficient way. It's not necessarily every pipe, but uh, you have to show that you're measuring it in an effective way within a certain uh, error. CASGEM was the groundwater elevation piece. Before SIGMA was adopted, we already had an addition to the law that said we had to measure all the wells themselves and find out where we are because, frankly, we had gaps in the data in groundwater in the San Joaquin Valley. Large areas, we didn't have enough information to figure out the condition. So uh, that was fairly important. This one is interesting. The California Recycled Water Policy is just a policy adopted by the State Water Resources Control Board, but embedded in it, uh, because recycled water carries an extra salt burden um, when you reuse water from a wastewater treatment plant, it picks up things during the process of humans using the water, and so it comes into the treatment plant and goes out the treatment plant a little saltier. Well, they didn't want the responsibility for managing that salt strictly on the utility. They felt that it was a more universal issue, and so salt and nutrient management plans were then added to groundwater responsibilities for people. So that's now also in Sigma, but it was already embedded in the recycled water policy. The flood protection plan, uh, we have a new plan that covers a lot of the northern part of the San Joaquin Valley and most of the Sacramento Valley, and it has uh, things like new construction of levees that have to be bigger, fatter, so it takes more land setbacks. It has an impact on, on the nearby land and will affect farmers. Uh, also an opportunity, though, integrating with what uh, Brett Fogg talked about in terms of using types of land for groundwater recharge, so we'll have to integrate those, those concepts. Irrigated lands uh, update was just a fairly recent thing, and that is that groundwater quality evaluation was added to the agricultural lands uh, re regional board uh, policy. In other words, now farmers have to evaluate what it is that their groundwater is uh, doing, and so there are the coalitions that uh, Terry Clausen talked about are responsible for adding that into the reporting that they have to do to uh, the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Uh, the Right to Clean Drink Water Act, a uh, very important thing. It said that everybody has a right to clean drinking water, and we have to figure out how to implement that and deal with that. And it's a challenge, as you heard earlier, we have over 100 disadvantaged communities in the San Joaquin Valley, so we're going to have to figure out how to do that. Here comes Sigma, <clears throat> 2014. And then we had a drought emergency declaration last year that gave the governor uh, extraordinary powers to uh, demand conservation throughout the state of California. Fortunately, we met the goals, and uh, this past winter was a little bit better, and we relaxed it a little bit. But nonetheless, uh, it's changed the ethic considerably in California, I, I think especially in urban landscapes. A lot of people have pulled out their lawns, and they're not putting them back. So, 
Uh, so that's kind of the setting that we have to work with in understanding what are our institutions are and what are they going to have to do in the future. This is a map uh, also, uh, this was discussed, uh, Eric, uh, Eric in particular talked about the number of agencies in Kern County. So this is a map where Kern County is, the San Joaquin Valley, it's over 150 public water agencies that have water supply in, in the San Joaquin Valley. So that's part of the uh, universe of people that we have to work with in, in, in particular now Sigma. And in fact, I'm the university's representative on the Sigma GSA in my area. Uh, the Fresno State has a farm of about a thousand acres and we pump groundwater. So we, we're joining the, the local GSA. And quite frankly, what's happening, um, exactly what Thad talked about, as well as Eric, and that is that Sigma is breaking down around some of these fault lines of these existing agencies. So instead of having it over a whole groundwater basin, we have six, I think, now in Fresno, <clears throat> maybe seven or eight, because one area is looking to break up smaller. Uh, Kern County and then its agencies are forming a bunch of them. So now we have the beginnings of chaos, quite frankly, and that's what everybody we talked about, they're worried about. So Sigma is just only a piece of the puzzle, though. If you bring in all those other elements, what is it that we need to do to, to better organize everybody? <clears throat> Um, one of the tools that we did use in the past that was very successful, 2002, we formed integrated regional water management plans. And uh, they worked on a collaborative basis and they got people together who hadn't worked together before. It did include cities, uh, agricultural water agencies, and others uh, all working together, including disadvantaged communities as an interested party in most cases. Um, and so we did uh, start working together, and in fact, they closely matched somewhat the groundwater basins. What happened was in Sigma, we didn't incentivize going back to that particular organizational structure and make regional water agencies one of the other ways of implementing Sigma. So it fell back to these water supply agencies. So we actually took a step back. So now, I think the real opportunity is that somewhat, somehow in this process, we have to look at what are some of the institutional alternatives to improve efficiency, not only of the agencies themselves, but you also heard of the regulatory controls. Thank you. Thank you, Sarge. And actually, that's a great segue to where I wanted to go for all the panelists. Hold on just a minute. I think, um, I think collectively there's been a pretty good point made that um, particularly in the San Joaquin Valley we're suffering from a tremendous amount of jurisdictional and institutional overlap um, and I will say that as Sigma was being developed and you heard Dave Gutierrez talk a little bit about this earlier the intent was that local agencies local water agencies and land use agencies have continue uh, the responsibility for managing this groundwater resource. But I'm not sure that the authors of Sigma contemplated, um, you know, these hundreds of entities scurrying back to their respective district boundaries and trying to figure out how to hold on to, to what they have. So I think one of the, the interesting parts of the, the Envisioning San Joaquin Valley Futures Project is to consider the institutional challenges, I think we've heard about them, but I want to shift that to a conversation about what the institutional opportunities are. Now, Richard, how do we move the cows? Um, or how do we move the water to the cows, right? I think that was your point. Um, and uh, Alvar, you know, the, the conversation about some of the promising pathways, you know, what, what types of institutional challenges or opportunities or changes do we need to make? So. If, if all four of you would kind of speak to that, and we'll start with you, Richard, about what you think we, you know, we need to do with this mess that we have. Uh, I, 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 I'm surprised in, in, in all the discussion, no one's mentioned Orange County. Um, Orange County has run its groundwater basin incredibly successfully, both for re avoiding sailing intrusion and running it through three droughts of drawdown, replenishment, without adjudication, with a very simple cost allocation mechanism. And uh, so guys just hop in your cars, drive down there, and say, how do you do it? 
Um, now, they're, they're, they are very different in some ways. They had outside sources of replenishment water that don't exist anymore. That's key. And they didn't have to cut people back, which, of course, this will happen. You saw my map. They had lots of money. That helps. <laughs> they, had, they were first on the scene. That helps. But they have established a simple institution, which is avoiding what you heard in the previous panels, which were the fears of adjudication. And it works. They've shown how it works. And I see no reason why it can't be adapted for other more difficult but similar situations. So the answer is, I'm sorry, I'm an economist. It's markets, guys. We've got to allow people to trade their pumping rights and to trade their groundwater rights uh, as long as there are no external effects. Well, I'm going to jump on Dan Kozad's bandwagon, and that is, I think, one of the first investments we have to make is get people talking to each other, and that requires leadership. So I, I think we need to both educate leaders and we need to educate more people at the local level as to what the ground rules are working together should be, because right now they all are operating under a different set of rules because they have different objectives. So we have to have a foundation down at the local level so that they have a common language to work forward with. Um, I want to get back a little bit about the previous panels. And I think one of the challenges that is m most interesting of that can uh, hate in a little bit the uh, uh, implementation of Sigma is uh, between state, local agencies, and also the end users of waters, how we incentivize end users to, to do the kind of right things, like groundwater recharge on others. So uh, one of the things that, that Sigma uh, has, has been doing is like getting together that people, as, like what we were saying. And we heard before that one of the things that Sigma is not doing is that it's not conceived to manage uh, explicitly our groundwater and surface water generally. But I think that that's a, a, a really big opportunity of, of the implementation of Sigma. The big people is getting together and so they have this, this incentive to try to manage the, th the things together. And, and this is what we have to, to look for, I think. Yeah, I want to second what uh, Sarch has said in, in um Seconding, actually, uh, Daniel Kozak and the and the need for leadership, and the, the need for the need for communication across all of these different institutions. I I don't know that we're going to be the way the train is going, that we're going to get around having these multiple layers of local institutions. We will have the GSAs. We already have the integrated regional water management groups. We already have agricultural coalitions. And we now have coalitions of agricultural coalitions. Uh, we will soon have, and, and Daniel can speak to that, I'm, I'm kind of somewhat removed from it, but we will soon have local salt and nutrient management planning agencies. Um, they will all be needing to talk to each other, um, and, and the, the structure is actually laid out for that, in parts because Sigma also addresses water quality issues. Um, it, and I'm not sure how, how how clear that structure is. I, I, I'm a little bit afraid that it could potentially be used to by some to say, well, Sigma actually controls water quality, and so it takes precedence over, over the Port of Cologne Water Quality Control Act, which is what the regional water quality control boards are implementing. Um, but I'm actually optimistic. We do have a conversation that somewhat bridges between these agencies, and some of the, some of the folks here in the room, some of you guys, are in these various boardrooms and meetings um, on Sigma, on the Integrated Regional Water Management Planning, on, on Ag Water Coalitions, and I think we're going to we're going to have to have more of that. Um, perhaps there is a role for agricultural water coalitions in implementing Sigma to some degree, um, in in or and or working with farmers to the degree that ag coalitions are going to be very concerned with agricultural management practices, there might be opportunities for them to take on some of the roles that need to be taken on in order to implement Sigma. Um, 
as well as um, doing the um, salt and nutrient management planning. So I think, I don't think we're going to get around having these institutions, but the dialogue between these and having, being flexible in, in, in the coordination is going to be very important. Let me pause for a moment. Anybody, I, I guess I'll move to you in terms of questions or things you'd like to discuss, probe here a bit further. Yes, sir. So one of the things that hasn't been mentioned is that we talk about the farmers, but we haven't talked about the people who work for farms, the people of color, the Mexican Americans, and Asian Americans, who, and basically lower, lower income people who have, who, whose biggest investment is their homes, and their homes in the central, in central California. And, you know, we're, doing, we're going to be doing a $15 minimum wage, which I think personally is a great thing because California is to be sustainable and fair. And if you want to buy food, you buy it from California. It's going to be sustainable and fair. I think that's a great opportunity. But who, have you assessed the impact that that may have, and specifically on, on wealth creation or wealth destruction for people of color in the Central Valley? What's going to do? I mean, we talked about, you know, the problems with the environment. I don't... I mean, I'd love to see, you know, some, several Fresnos. My fear is that we're not going to have any major cities in the Central Valley, and all these Mexican-American people who put all their wealth and housing are going to lose that. We're going to have a foreclosure crisis as this is implemented. Richard, any uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not a pessimist. Um, the, the, remember, California economy grows. Why does it grow? because we produce what the middle class want to buy and eat. We are the only region in the US that does that. We are, and, and as long as we don't have too many Brexits and other problems like that, and the world economy keeps going, uh, we have a vast middle class and they want to buy California produce for its quality and its safety. So we have a growing market. We have a growing industry in the valley, and we can cope. But it's extremely important to have something like Sigma, because what, who gets hit most and first by falling groundwater tables? It's the small rural communities, and we saw that in the drought recently, and it is the small farmers with the small wells who can't afford to put down the deep wells. Sigma is extreme, and groundwater stabilization is extremely important for an equitable valley and a growth growing industry. Because if we don't have the security of groundwater, we cannot grow the high value perennial crops. We've got to have both. And we can get them both. I worked on rural issues for a long time. I was the president of an economic development company or corporation in Western Fresno County when David was the manager of Westlands Water District. And it's a challenge. You're absolutely right. We could not find alternative strategies that were of any value to sustain those communities when they retired the land during the, the drainage issues. The uh, only thing that came in was a prison in Mendota. Is the only thing. <clears throat> that's, that's not, uh, that's not going to be something that's going to work every place. So that is one of the issues that I think really needs some attention. Now, having said that, I think that is one area where I think we can um, put on a fast track, speed up the um, insulation of upgraded drinking water and wastewater systems because the other thing I also see is that larger communities may be constrained in their growth. And I think actually small towns may have a resurgence. Um, we have some role models and some very successful ones. Kerman is the one that comes to mind in, in Fresno County. And, uh, but I think the investment needs to be made from the larger part of the population, they're, they're going to need help. It cannot be done uh, by itself. It has to be a commitment. And this has been a problem, I think, in this country all over the place. This is not unique to California. Small rural communities have struggled in many places for a long time, and they are the first uh, victims of the, uh, all the other economic changes. And so we've never done a good job at it, and we'd better figure out a way to do it. A really quick note uh, about the project that, that I didn't mention in the, in the presentation is that um, you know, we are starting the project. We, we launched this project that, uh, by the end of last year. We expect to release two uh, main issues. Uh, first, a report on the challenges that the, 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 valley, is facing, the valley is facing, uh, 
by the end of this year, and the main report probably will be a book uh, by the end of, of next year. So we are just starting. And about your, about your question, uh, definitely we want to uh, analyze distributional effects, economic effects, and also all the quality issues that are affecting small communities and rural communities and even uh, farm workers in the valley. So we, we will address that. Another question? Next question, Phil? Yeah, um, I just wanted to, to actually comment on some of Richard's comments. So um, the, the first one being the Orange County Water District system. That system um, basically takes all the wastewater and does tertiary treatment, more or less, of like six or seven upstream communities from the base of the mountains there to the Riverside Orange County border. And they take that water and they infiltrate it into the groundwater system. And so the analogy of it to places that do not have the extra supply of water is, I don't think it's quite fair. They have plenty of water and they've been able to, they, they, they got in there first like you said, but they have, they've taken that water and they use that water and, and nobody else, you know, has that kind of water resources. The second comment is on the cows. So that area in Orange County that you talk about, just east of that used to be the dairy preserve. All those dairies moved um, in about 1996, which I know because that's when my dissertation ended on the effects of dairies on groundwater in that area. And so the infrastructure for dairies is expensive, but they'll move. And so, you know, whether they stay where they are or they move, they still move. There's still the economy, stupid, all right? And the third thing is, is that we have this economy, in, and, and this goes to your point, we have this economy in the, in the San Joaquin Valley, and it's, it's the, it has the greatest wealth of disadvantaged communities in the state. And so this is, an, this is a place that has had abundant water, abundant nutrients, abundant, gone relatively unregulated, more or less, I mean, it's gotten worse, but over the last 30 or 40 years, and during that time, and they've had cheap labor, they had an abundance of all this wealth, and, and it hasn't really trickled down to the communities. And so when we talk about the economic value of ag, which is certainly important, but when you do the analysis of the economic value of ag, you really do need to come in and figure out how you're going to do the economic value for these communities because the reality is, is that when the dairy preserve left that area of Orange County and housing moved in, that area became wealthier and they had less water demand. And so the, there's a... Um, I mean, I think it's, ag is an important part of the San Joaquin Valley, I don't want to say it's not, but the sim simple analysis of what's happening with the producers is just that. It's simple. And it's a lot more complicated than that. And that's my comment. Any reaction to that? Yeah. Point taken, Phil, about Orange County. But remember, uh, I, I was struck one time as I was talking to a, a lawyer in Chino and he pointed out this guy in a, in a four-window Dodge, and he said, and, and he was wearing bib overalls, he said, that's the wealthiest man in the town, and he's a dairyman. And the dairies didn't move, they were pushed, because if you give a dairyman millions of dollars for condos, what does he do with those dollars? Well, he gets a bigger dairy, of course. And so the dairies did walk, and they walked over the hills into the valley. But I don't see the dairies in the valley being pushed out by the valley condominiums, as they were in the Chino Basin. Okay. Secondly, yes, uh, it's quite true that we have a number of highly disadvantaged communities in the valley, and th there are situations which are far from socially acceptable. But ag provides the jobs that those people are skilled at working at. And we have to provide the jobs. Yes, we do have to provide a better wage, of course, but 
without that core employment, and, and you saw Alvar's, Alvar's histograms, the situation would be even worse than it is now, and we've got to improve it. I guess my question is to, uh, to uh, Richard, but I think any others could, could uh, maybe feedback on this as well. One of the things that we've seen in the San Joaquin Valley is considerable change in our irrigation systems, technology, how we use water, how much we water, water we use on a per acre basis. We've changed our cropping systems. The point I'm getting to here is, is that as we get more efficient, we continue to build up salts in our soil profile. Okay, we've done this for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Now we're adding more and more of these drip systems. So over time, my, I guess my concern is, is that we're not uh, quite painting the picture of the future quite accurately when we don't account for the significant increases in soil salinity, that change in the water balance that we're promoting, and, and, and we're, we actually have, have many programs out there where we're, we're introducing uh, more and more money into pressurized systems that really aren't allowing us to leach these salts. So as we look forward at our, at our, at our front economics, are we taking these, these issues into consideration? Uh, I'll be brief because I've gone too long. But I, I, I agree with you totally, of course. And it came out in the earlier panels. What we've got to have is an, a net, net metering uh, concept. Uh, that we use in power, and so you have a net effect, and then you can subsidize inefficient irrigation, um, as Eric was talking about that they're, they're doing, inefficient in as much as it's good for recharge. And so I think, and, and thirdly, we go to Graham's point, that the best way to deal with many of the contaminants in the groundwater is to replenish the groundwater stock. Put all those things together and start to look at it as an, but it's, it's as simple as this. As long as that asset, it's a resource asset, doesn't belong to you, you, you don't take care of it. When did you last check the oil in a rental car? Uh, that's as simple as that. Um, you don't check the oil in rental cars, you do in your own car. And so what Sigma will do for the first time will give the property rights, and we've heard how it's done, per unit land to the individual. And as long as they're allowed to do with them what's in their best interest, we'll probably end up in a better place. Thomas, anything to add there? Yeah, the salinity piece is a really tough nut yes. to crack. Um, and I, I want to kind of counter maybe a little bit of what Helen said earlier. Um, I think there is something to be said to actually think about extending recharge what we call clean agricultural uh, recharge to relatively large amounts of land where you don't recharge four or ten feet in a winter, but you char recharge an extra foot or an extra two feet, partly to actually push that salt out of the soil where it gets to be a, a, danger, a risk to the, to the crop, partly because to what Graham and, and Richards has just said, in, in the overall context, there's something to be said of of moving salt back to the river and, ha and losing it through the river. CV salts, if I see it correctly, and Daniel, um, uh, speak up if I'm, if I'm wrong, CV salts looks at sort of the, the whole balance in a black box fashion. It looks at you know, how much salt is into the, in the system, how close is that to the drinking water limit, first, uh, uh, the secondary standard for, for drinking water, and so how much more can we put in, or if we're already above it, how much would we like to put in, and therefore how much desalt, how, how, how large of a desalter plant do we have to put in to balance the salt that goes in with salt that we're taking out of this black box groundwater basin? And it's somewhat ignorant of, of spatial distributions. It's just an overall, it's sort of looking at it as an overall balance. And in the proposal on the table is to, to balance those salt inputs with um, desalination at a fairly large scale and at a relatively large cost. Um, and, the, and the question that's on the table is whether or not we can afford that economically because we're talking about something that's on the order of a billion dollars plus in the Central Valley alone per year. Can I add something quick to that? I, I think one of the other answers is, Dan, I think you can appreciate because we're starting to see a lot of this stuff as tech. 
I think it, the precision that we can do these kinds of things is going to improve in the future. So if you have a salt-affected area in a particular field, you'll be able to address the salt-affected area, whether it's sensors in the soil or looking literally at what's going on in the plant in terms of ion ex exchange or whatever it is that's, that's happening because we're starting to see that technology come out of the Silicon Valley folks already. So. I think there's some hope that we can manage it in, in a more precise way, but you're still right in terms of mass balance. We've got a lot of salt. We've got time for one more brief question, I think. So, well, maybe two, but. Um, so I think this question's mostly for Richard. So when you're considering um, if a crop is highly valuable, how do you take into consideration domestic value versus international value? And so. You know, in thinking about virtual water losses from our groundwater basins here in California, is there, you know, is a groundwater market the only way to reconcile this, or are there ways that we can use trade regulation and law to kind of um, protect the interests of California residents? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm a, a trade person. Um, I know that's not fashionable these days, but um, it's done more good for poor people in the world than anything else. So I'm, I'm not worried about virtual water because I have a virtual gasoline problem. When I drive my truck, I'm actually virtually burning stuff from Saudi Arabia. It makes me feel bad. No, it doesn't. I don't care. And, and, and nor should I when I'm exporting walnuts and almonds and that money is going back to poor people in the valley who are helping them, or rich people. Um, so uh, trade is essentially beneficial to California, particularly California agriculture, because we are better at it. Graham, last, last question. A, a comment on Orange County. I think the most difficult thing of water management is controlling demand. Uh, there's very few good examples of where someone successfully controlled demand. We hope Sigma will control demand, but I think it remains to be seen how successful we'll be at that. In Orange County, the, the unique thing to me is they use a very simple water pricing structure that has been very successful w without imposing any edicts or, or con restrictions at, at controlling demand. And I think a, a viable question is still, to what extent must you have a, that kind of market water system interwoven with Sigma for it to, to succeed at, at at uh, managing the water, which requires controlling demand. And if I can add to that question on your comment earlier about the small farmer with the small well, isn't that market solution pushing that smaller farmer out anyway because the price of water is going to get so high? Not at all. I, 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 I'm a small farmer with a small, two small wells. I, I want a market, and, and, and I would feel much safer um, because I had this experience of my neighbor uh, putting down a 550-foot well, a minor 220. I, I, feel a, I feel a lot safer with Sigma, and, and my property would be worth more because it would have secure groundwater. I'm going to go ahead and wrap here because I know we have one last panel. I do want to uh, encourage you all to keep an eye out for this study and some of the, the results that come out of it. I, I think it's going to be informative of hopefully the opportunities that Sigma layered on top of a lot of other, you know, accumulated policy and regulation in California um, create for the San Joaquin Valley. And I think you've heard a more positive spin than what I hear when I go home and try to talk to farmers about what Sigma is going to do to them. Um, I, I do think there's a great opportunity here to think about, like we were with integrated regional water management planning 10 years ago or more about alignment of resource management strategies. Sigma blew that up for a while uh, because people have retreated in trying to figure out how they can hold on to what they have instead of solving the larger scale problem. I think we're going to morph back to, to more integrated discussions about how we recharge. You heard that this morning, how recharge is cited to deal with water quality issues. Um, the whole paradigm for flood water management has changed from 
the you know less than five years ago the flood management strategy was let's get water out of the area as quick as we can now we figure out how to harness it and recharge it so all of these alignment strategies are things that i think will come out through this study i want to thank the panelists and uh, we'll look forward to the next panel thank you <laughs>